Our next speaker is Daniel Procida. Uh, Daniel works at DVO on Django CMS, Aldrin, and other Django based projects. He also been involved in organizing DjangoCon Europe 2015 and PyCon Namibia 2016. So, big applause to him. Um, th thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here because it's genuinely an honor to be here at your first uh, PyCon. Um, congratulations to the Slovakian Python community for this superbly organized event. I was, um, I'm really impressed by what I see has been achieved here. And I think the fact that your first PyCon has brought more than 400 people in is a really encouraging sign for Python's, the Python community and industry's future here. So um, congratulations to all of you for that. Um, and I have to start with an apology, um, because I'm doing the wrong talk. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> I realized at about 9 o'clock yesterday morning that the talk that I said I would do wasn't the one that I've been busy preparing for the last few months. So, anyway, so, so speaking of how well things are organized. So um, I hope this is not too much of a disappointment for you. Um, my name is Daniele Procida. Uh, I'm the community and documentation manager at uh, DVO, the Swiss uh, Django company. Um, I'm a, a developer of Django CMS. Does anyone use Django CMS here? Oh, yeah, there's always a few people. Thank you. Um, I'm a core developer of the Django project. Uh, sorry, I work for DVO. I'm a core developer of the um, Django project. I'm a board member of the Django Software Foundation, too. And you can feel free to contact me anytime on various electronic places. OK, so what do programmers actually like? Now, I probably don't need to tell you that there are all kinds of stereotypes that surround programming and programmers. And some of them are fair enough. And some of them most definitely are not. So you know, programmers, yes. Um, all they do is watch science fiction films and listen to heavy metal. So, Programming has a reputation for being a mechanical, unimaginative discipline. And I think that's actually really unfair. Because if you're a programmer, you'll know very well that a programmer's work can bear the imprint of a programmer's creative personality just as much as any other uh, writer's work. But good luck explaining that to a non-programmer. Good luck explaining that one of the pleasures of programming is a creative pleasure. Now, I have always myself found pleasures in seeing and understanding and playing with patterns and rules and connections in language. And that pleasure feels similar to the kind of pleasure that I have in programming. And I think many other programmers also experience this. And I think that in some ways, what programmers like doing with language is quite similar to what poets like doing with language. Now, I'm going to just skip over a couple of sections here, because I don't think we really have time for this. We can talk about this uh, later. But um, there are some things that programmers and poets both like doing in different ways. In fact, artists of all different kinds like to do these things. So uh, taking language and turning it back on itself, referring it to itself, taking it apart to see how it works, finding in it elegant, economical, powerful principles, explaining or exploring patterns and rules and connections, putting it together in new ways and extracting new meaning. Now, poets and other writers do this. I don't want to say that poetry or art are the same as programming, or that a good programmer will be a good poet, or vice versa. They're not. They're completely different disciplines. Programming is not art. It's not poetry. But they meet, and they have connections in some notable places. One of them is the kind of sense of humor and aesthetics that programmers have. There are certain jokes and kinds of playfulness that programmers will get straight away. And you know when you have one of those jokes that the programmers you know will enjoy it. Um, in particular, programmers seem to be fascinated by rule-governed play. We'll talk more about this. And they respond strongly to it when they find it 
not just in programming, but in poetry, music, and art, and so on. And so there are some notable uh, writers and artists whose work and ideas speaks to programmers. I, I think it's the way that programmers think that makes them especially ready to understand this intersection of rules, processes, and play that characterizes certain kinds of art. And even if the thing that you're looking at has nothing to do with programming, often you can see something in it that you know will appeal to programmers. Programmers also love systems. And th three of the things they love best in systems are also things that are very interesting outside programming, loops, self-reference, and hierarchy. So we'll start looking at some of these straight away, starting with loops. Um, years ago, I found a website called TechStark. Does anybody know? Remember TechStark? OK, it's a, an ancient website, about 15 years old, written in um, Java. And I spent a lot of time in this website 15 years ago. It's quite magical and, and quite beautiful. And it shows you one of the things you can do when you loop over text with code. Now, I have to do this in a very old version of <laughs> uh, Windows, because it's, the Java is so old, I can't get it to work on my Mac. Now, let's hope this works, because I, I never have very much luck with this, OK? So it's going to take uh, the text of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and it redraws it twice in a circle. And then it shows you the relations between the words. It's actually kind of reading the text right now. But we can go and find a word. So I can't really see things too well. We could find a character. So if we, in the middle here, for example, you'll find things like Alice should be somewhere in the middle because she's represented right the way around the circle. But somewhere over here should be, um, I can't actually see that. The Dormouse should be around here somewhere because the Dormouse is in that sector of the story near the beginning. So you, you can find uh, anything and see what it's connected to. You can put any text. Uh, into this and play with it in different ways. Um, Look at textarc.org and spend some time in it. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and let's, well, I can't even see it properly. So I'm just going to go back to my um, uh, slides here. But that's one of the things that uh, um, started making me think a long time ago about uh, some of these ideas. Um, so one of the things you lose in Textarc is a sense of the content. You don't get the content anymore, but you get its structure presented as its metadata. So why do structure and metadata matter in text? Well, we've thrown out the content, or it's no longer visible to us. But we also gain something else, because we see new meaning that perhaps was previously obscured. And, and when I say see, I mean literally see, because in that visual representation, you can see things in a way that you can't when you're reading the text. We can see who is associated with whom. We can see who appears when and with whom. We can see who dominates the story. Um, and we can see this literally. So don't be distracted by the fact that what TextArc does is amusing and literary. It's also powerful and significant. And this is not lost on large corporations and government agencies who also understand the power of those relationships, that's structure and metadata. They know what those things mean. In various countries in the world, right now or recently or in the future, the governments anxious to have legislation enacted that will give their agencies the right to similar information about our communications and activities. That is the metadata, the structure of our communications and activities. And they'd never do anything like eavesdrop on their citizens, listen to their conversations. They only want the metadata, they don't want to spy on our lives. So don't worry, our privacy is safe and assured. I hope you can read that from the back, but this is basically the idea that here's the politician trying to reassure people that uh, recording metadata keeps you safe. Well, in fact, we know an awful lot just from metadata, even if we don't know anything about what's being said. <laughs> Just this morning, I saw this. Yeah, of course they can. They can visualize information to find out what's going on without knowing 
what that actual information is, but just looking at its structure and metadata. So this is, of course, interesting to uh, programmers and has implications beyond programming. Now, if you noticed on TextArc, the other text at the top was Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet. It's not there by chance. For whatever reason, Hamlet is one of the texts that people go straight for when they want to start doing this kind of work with texts, when they want to start exploring texts in this kind of way. And Hamlet brings me to Ulises Carrion. Uh, he was a Mexican artist and writer. He, he died quite young. A lot of his work was concerned with playing with texts, manipulating, analyzing, deconstructing, synthesizing them, often by following simple rules. And I mentioned earlier that programmers uh, um, will really get something, and this is an example. So I'm gonna play you one of my favorite pieces by uh, Ulises Carrion. Um, the first time I heard it, by chance, I thought, what the hell is this? And when I realized what I was hearing, I just burst out uh, laughing in recognition of its simplicity and logic. And when I play this to other people, that's their same reaction. But then it divides the world into programmers and non-programmers, because the non-programmers are irritated and baffled. Like, what is the point? The programmers suddenly start smiling and laughing. I'm not saying that every actual programmer, I'm talking about people with the souls of programmers. So there might be some people who are not programmers who have the souls of programmers and vice versa. So um, anyway, this is, um, here's Hamlet. And here's Ulysses Carrion's Bernardo. Hamlet for Francisco. two voices. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Horatio. Marcelos. Francisco. Marcelos. Francisco. Marcelos. Bernardo. Horatio. Bernardo. Marcelos. Bernardo. So, Marcelos. Can we turn the sound down for a moment? Bernardo. I can't stop Horatio. it here. Bernardo. <laughs> Marcelos. Bernardo. OK. So anyway, I, I, I think this is um, funny. I think it's hilarious. But it's not just funny. It's a new interpretation of Hamlet, a Hamlet for two voices, left speaker and right speaker, without any content. We have only the structure. We've lost all the content. You won't know that Hamlet is a story about revenge, murder, or desire. You won't know that Hamlet is a prince or that the story is set in Denmark. But there's a lot to learn. We learn, we can learn from that, uh, which, by the way, lasts about 15 minutes. <laughs> we learn who is still around at the end of the story, which is not a given if you're in one of Shakespeare's tragedies that you'll still be around at the end. Um, we can discover whom the story revolves around, who dominates the conversations, who hangs around with whom. We can guess who is conspiring with whom. You know, governments would love to know that. Yeah. Just like government agencies. So there's new stuff. Bernardo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> As I say, I, I really love this in the same reason that I loved TextArc 15 years ago. But 15 years ago, I wasn't a programmer. Um, I'm a programmer now, and when I see this kind of thing, what I think is what I know you're also thinking. Key value pairs. Looping over a sequence of key value pairs. I, I played this to my colleagues a few months ago and had exactly the effect uh, I expected because they're programmers. I got this a couple of days later in the instant messages. And um, I did a little bit of work on it myself. And so let me show you some Python. Um, OK, so here's a bit of Python code. And we go to a text source. Um, we um, use a request to pull it down. We put it into beautiful soup. We loop over it. And um, then we call the OSX say command. So, uh, Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. Bernardo. Francisco. So, this is my Bernardo. Um, Hamlet Francisco. for two voices. Bernardo. Being Francisco. Being performed by um, Bernardo. Python. Francisco. Horatio. Marcellus. So, Francisco. So, that's, you know, I was quite pleased with that. That's quite, that's quite simple, but that's quite fun. So um, computers are the perfect tools for this sort of play, this kind of exploration, analysis, or, or discovery. And if you're interested in it, it's everywhere and very accessible. Um, you can, um, there's a whole field of experimental literature that's ripe 
for this. Uh, the Ulipo group, the Ouvoir de Literature Potentielle, the Workshop of Potential Literature, a French group of mathematicians, artists, and writers who play these kinds uh, of games. We don't really have time to talk about this, unfortunately, but ask me afterwards because their work is ripe for exploration in programming. Or if you want, uh, maybe, has anyone, anyone read Microsurfs by Douglas Copeland? Yeah, so here, it's just two pages in the book where the text has been divided into consonants and vowels, you know. What happens when you do this? So people are playing these kinds of games, not just highbrow literary experimenters, but also popular no novelists. We can play endless games of this kind. And I've been talking about games and playing, and some of it's a lot of fun, but it's also very serious, because play doesn't just mean fun. Play is the looseness in a mechanical connection, the extent to which one side of a link is not determined um, by the other. H has anyone here driven a 1970s Datsun or, or, or an old car? Because you might find that there's a lot of play in the steering mechanism. That's what we mean by play, where that, that part where the things are, there's a, a looseness in the middle. It still works, but there's, there's some play. So, but play depends upon a linkage, a connection or a constraint. If there were no constraints at all, there couldn't be any play. Um, so it exists in the, cons in the context of constraints and rules, where the joints or the rules permit some limited movement. If there were no play at all in a mechanism, then the whole thing would be completely locked and it wouldn't be able to move at all. You know, think about gears if there were no friction, if, if there were only friction and, and, and no play. And the rules and connections in language are just open and loose enough to allow both for rigorous meaning and play within the same system. So play of this kind is enjoyed by artists and writers just as much as uh, programmers. Um, and I want to play you another recording by Ulises Carrion, which is his um, first Spanish lesson. Again, I heard this on the radio the first time I encountered him. And at first, I was puzzled what I was hearing and then completely overwhelmed by what was going on. So very briefly, in case you don't know Spanish, Espanol is Spanish. Uh, es means is oh, or is it. So you can say es verdad. Is it true? Es, es verdad, it's true. So that's just, um, that's enough for you to understand this. So um, um, let me play you um, the first Spanish lesson of um, Ulises Carrion. Español. Español. Es español. Es español. Sí, es español. Es ese español. Sí, ese es español. Es ese español español. Sí, es español es español. Es ese es español español. Sí, ese es español es español. Es si es español español. Sí, si es español es español. Es si es español español. Sí, si es español. Es español. Es si es español. No, si ese no es español. And so on. So I, I could you know, hear people laughing. I've played that to people. Obviously, people not with the souls of programmers. And they said, this is a really shit way to learn Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> And I've played it to, to other people, writers said, this is awful, I, I don't get this at all. I think, well, you know, there's something missing in, in, in you know, you're not getting something really important there. So I love this, it, it's fiendish, it's maddening. It's language about language that it loops over its own structures, it recurses on itself, it's language that eats language. Now, usually when something consumes itself, it reduces quickly to nothingness. But in this case, something new and strange and magical comes out. And it's a perfect example of playing with rules and processes. And as a program, it makes me itch. <laughs> um, it is a program in a way. It's following its own logic, obeying its own internal rules. And I loved it 15 years ago, even when I wasn't a programmer. Um, but um, when I look at it now, what I think is, could I create a first Python lesson on the same basis with some Python code that feeds into itself. 
I, I actually had a little go at doing this. I didn't get very far, but um, the, the rules are very simple. You interpolate self-similar fragments. You corrupt fragments when you're searching for validity, whether it's you know, is Spanish or is, is actual Python. You can drop and add and move fragments around. You can seek homophones, words which sound the same, or, or, or new words that are constructed. Um, you evaluate the validity to a binary value and then feed it back into itself. So, you know, really we have the technology. You can give a string, you can feed it to KW list or, or built-ins or run eval on it. Uh, I didn't get very far with it because uh, I got distracted by making a Raspberry Pi represent the characters in Hamlet with flashing different colored LEDs. So that's as far as I got. I will return to this one day. But we started with loops just like um, Nick uh, mentioned, of course, everybody does. Even the simplest loop, loop represents power. It doesn't matter how trivial the loop is. It unleashes an infinite sequence, and then we'll try to make that real. And there are many constructs in programming, but the one I love the best, the one that seems the most beautiful and powerful, is, is the loop, because loops, they're perfect and they're simple. But, you know, the fascination of go to 10 is, is rather limited. Go to 10 is only interesting for being infinite rather than for anything that comes out of it. It's not about anything, and it's always the same. It's when self-reference gets added to the loop, as in the first Spanish lesson, that things get really interesting, because then you get this loop of self-reference, of something feeding on itself. So one day, I might make more progress with my first, first Python lesson, this loop of self-reference in Python, and I might build my snaky self-referential loop. But Snaky self-referential loops have been around for a very, very long time. Nothing's really new. new. The concept of a snake that eats its tail is much, much older than somebody imagine a python snake eating its tail. This is the ruboros, um, the very ancient symbol in many cultures of uh, renewal and regeneration. It's a kind of, it represents, represents a kind of impossible magic to make something that eats itself. But sometimes it really happens, like in Ulysses Carrion, when something comes out that wasn't there before. Not just something new, but a new kind of thing. And programmers, as much as artists, are fascinated by what happens when a self-reflecting process loops. And we're lucky because we have the perfect tools for it. Artists have uh, tackled the um, uh, Ruboros in, in, in their own ways. This is a representation by M.C. Escher, who was also fascinated by loops and self-reference. And this brings me to someone who I think is one of the most interesting thinkers and writers on the sub subject, Douglas Hofstadter. Um, his best-known book, uh, Gödel Escher Bach, explores art, music, and logic consciousness, and it's a an utterly remarkable book, driven by the same fascination with loops and self-reflecting processes. And in the book, he's in search of, uh, his ultimate goal is um, the, our own human self-consciousness, which is the, the ultimate um, self-reference. I, I read this book when I was, one summer when I was um, uh, 19, and I was, again, overwhelmed by it, by its ambition, its intelligence, the creative force that had been put together to make this uh, uh, an actual work. The book itself loops and recurses upon, its own, upon itself and its own structure. And ultimately, Hofstad is interested in what emerges from simple processes, from, from self-reflecting loops. Um, uh, by the way, he, he, he's a really interesting fellow, and um, his sense of humor and aesthetics um, appeals very naturally to uh, programmers. He de devised Hofstadter's law, and Hofstadter's law says that it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstadter's law. So, you know, it's the <laughs> programmers love this kind of joke. Um, so he's interested in the emergence of complex structures and behaviors from simple processes. So uh, emergent properties of systems. An emergent property is one that arises in a system that can't be found anywhere in its components. You can look for the, for the behavior. You can look for the, the properties, but you won't find it in the components. So sometimes the property is geometrical order. So this is 
the effect of water erosion. You're not seeing something in the structure of the rocks or anything like that. You're seeing the effect of a process, an unpredictable effect that produces an order that doesn't exist anywhere in the process itself. Another example might be an ant column where column organization is nowhere to be found in the behavior of individual ants. It can't even be predicted from it, but yet in the system of ant interactions, a column, a new system that didn't exist before, emerges. Or in the art of Bridget Riley, where simply repeatedly following a line produces through the natural free play of the activity something that's not in any of its components. Or Google's Deep Dream that uses iterating patterns and generation algorithms, matching paths to holes, crossing levels of hierarchy from which um, new levels of really bizarre significance emerge. Evolution, natural selection in nature, can itself be considered an emergent property out of chemical or biological processes. Um, and because there are multiple levels of hierarchy in these systems, other properties in turn emerge from uh, evolution. They are emergent features of uh, evolution. So uh, there are numerous behaviors observed in nature whose explanations have been sought in emergence. Cooperative behavior is one of these. Why is there cooperative behavior within and even between species when it would seem at the level of individuals there's uh, no benefit in it? This image is a graph from a Python library, Axelrod, and it shows the success over time of uh, generations of strategies in uh, a tournament of the iterated prisoners dilemma. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here, so... Uh, um, so, this is a, I'll try and wrap up as quickly as I can. This is a search for the secret of cooperation in evolution. And you can do it in Python. Um, go and have a look at Axel Roddo or talk to me afterwards. Um, Hofstadter ultimately argues that consciousness is an emergent property that arises from the systems in the brain. First, we discussed loops and the magic that seems to follow when they become self-referential and something new comes out of them. Hofstadter adds levels of hierarchy to this so that we have loops within loops at different levels in the system. And his thesis is that hierarchies of self-referring loops um, lie at the heart of cognition and consciousness, that the human brain's neurological processes are based on loops, self-reference, logic, play. So it's an explanation for Cognition. Consciousness is an emergent property. You won't find it in the neurons of the brain. You won't find it by looking at the components of the brain. But you need to understand the system, what happens in its loops. Um, maybe this is the origin of self-consciousness, as hierarchies of self-referring loops. Maybe consciousness is a system that nourishes itself, apparently impossibly like the snake that eats its tail, like the things that come out of this level in the two-dimensional level into another level that feed back into each other and feed back across the levels. In fact, one of his later books is called I Am a, a Strange Loop. He thinks that the eye of consciousness is the process of looping and self-referring um, across hierarchies. And it raises the possibility of an approach into cognition research and artificial intelligence that's not like some of the ones we see at the moment that are premised on brute force, big data, huge ontologies, but it begins with the simplest of tools, the little tools that we have right here at our fingertips in Python. It doesn't matter whether he's on the right track or not, really. The important thing is to have these ideas and exchanges and to be able to think about these things. And the thing that really delights me, that makes me very happy to be in the company of programmers, is that I find that the poets and artists and writers who fascinate me and the things that fascinate me in programming come back in a pleasing circle to the things that have uh, puzzled me in philosophy uh, for decades. So I'm really delighted to see this snake eating uh, its, its tail. Um, it, it makes me feel that in, in programmers, I'm, I'm in the right kind of uh, philosophical company. So that's a quick list of the uh, things that uh, we looked at. Um, Jacquiem, thank you very much. Um, sorry for going on too much. Any questions? So the first one is, what's your favorite heavy metal band? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
No, I, uh, I'm not that much into, um, heavy, into metal. heavy metal, so I couldn't, really, I couldn't really give you an answer about that. <laughs> okay, next one. How do you encourage play in daily software development? I, in a way, I don't think it needs to be encouraged. I think that programmers just do it all the time through their, uh, their, their jokes and their little games and competitions in the Axelrod library, for example, that you've seen there. Now, that, that's a mathematical research tool. It was built by a colleague of mine at Cardiff University, Vincent Knight. But one of the most active contributors to that library is a 15-year-old boy who's devised strategies that uh, are um, extremely uh, successful in, in the evolutionary speaking. And programming is so much about play to begin with that I, I don't think that it's a struggle to do it. I think that uh, the play is right at our fingertips from the beginning. Okay, uh, what about the role of bugs in play? Uh, yeah, the, the, the unexpected thing, you know, think about how uh, bugs, you know, uh, a bug is a, like a bit of free play in your steering wheel, you know, where something didn't quite work out deterministically. And you can go to interesting places. Sometimes you crash, literally, you know, <laughs> with a free play. But sometimes, Something new will come out, a direction you didn't expect. And just think how much this happens, for example, if you listen to jazz, when something goes wrong. It's an opportunity to take things in a new direction. So, uh, too many bugs and the system breaks down. So you need this very interesting combination of rigor and, and, and connection and looseness to permit the free play. Okay, uh, the last one, because we are running out of time. Have you ever wrote any poetry? Oh, n nothing that I would uh, ever wish to inflict on anyone else. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy um, uh, doing things like uh, um, playing with the LEDs on a, on, a, on a Raspberry Pi to make them represent Hamlet for me. That, that's, that's, uh, that's quite enough fun. And, and doing talks like this, of course. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.